本能が目覚める RPG デジタルデビルサーガーアバタールチューナーみんなを助けに来たの。During their time developing for the PS2, it felt as if Atlas was fully locked in when it came to the games that they were making. Nocturne gave us a whole new battle system that, after over 20 years, and yes, it's been over 20 years now, crazy, isn't it? Still feels fresh and unique. Persona came swinging with the third and fourth games, which story wise is still remembered fondly. And then there was the Rider Kuzunoha games, which, despite having the same features as most Mega Ten games, ended up becoming an action RPG that, from what I've played, was really fun. Also, sorry for the little side. Tangent, but I think Atlas should consider making more action RPGs. I mean, okay, yeah, Persona 5 Strikers counts. I mean,、uh, okay, you know what I mean. But out of all the Mega Ten games released on this console, there's a set of games that I don't really hear much about. If there is anything about this game, it isn't as much as the others, and I wanted to change that. So for this and the next video, we're going to be checking out the underrated duology Digital Devil Saga. US audiences were introduced to Digital Devil Saga on April 5th, 2005, and the game has you playing as Surf, the leader of a tribe called the Embryon. And after getting the power to become demons and finding a mysterious girl named Sarah, they not only have to protect her, but they also have to fight their way through other tribes in order to reach Nirvana. Now, compared to Nocturne, which was made to drop kick you into next Sunday, Digital Devil Saga in its sequel was developed with accessibility in mind. And what I mean by this is that they wanted to appeal to a wider audience, which for the most part, it worked. Kinda. Mm. With this in mind, alongside a couple other things, a lot of the systems were either simplified or even removed to make this game easier. And if I had to give you the specifics, the easiest one to mention would be the way that battles work, which, while it takes the press turn system from Nocturne, it feels very similar to a particular game. Now, don't get it twisted, the game is still somewhat hard. It's a Mega Ten game, it's to be expected. But the best way to describe the difficulty is that it's not on the level in which it makes you want to rip your hair out. Fuck! Kind of. Most of the people involved with the development of Nocturne would also be responsible for this game as well, like Kazura Hishino, who worked as the director and producer for this game, Kazuma Kanako as the character designer, and Soji Magero and Kenichi Tsushia, who would work on the music and sounds. They also had the acclaimed Ichiro Itano as the movie director for this game. Now, if you're not familiar with who Itano is, he's responsible for working as an animator in Mobile Suit Gundam and as a director for Gantz, just to name some of the stuff he did, because there is a lot. And if you still don't know who he is, you probably will recognize shit like this. That's more likely in your favorite anime. As for the scenario of the game, it originally was a collaboration between Yu Godai and Tadashi Satomi, with the latter having done the scenario for the first three Persona games. However, during development, Satomi had to take the helm as the main scenario writer, as Yu Godai ended up having to leave the project due to various reasons. And one thing I can easily assure you is that this man knows how to make a good ass story, and with this game, it's no exception. Reception wise, people generally liked this game, with most of his praise going towards his story. The gameplay was also praised, but not a lot of people liked the repetitive gameplay loop, which is understandable. For the most part, I had a similar sentiment when I first played this game. I ended up playing Digital Devil Saga during the pandemic, and it was one out of the six games that ended up leaving a big impression on me. And it's been a game I've been looking forward to talking about since I first started this channel.、Uh, as for the other five games,、uh, if things work out, you may be able to see those five games this year, or at least three of them, maybe. No promises. Though, from what I remember about my time with this game, I remember not only loving it, But also disliking it, which is odd to say. What kept me going was this game's great story, even if the way the events rolled out was pretty simple. But that gameplay, yeah, it was a 50 50 toss up of it being, you know, pretty good to it being absolutely annoying. 
Regardless, I was excited to play through this game for the second time and really see if my original opinions held true. Now, originally, I was supposed to do the Majin Tensei games, which... Wait, wait, wait! Yeah, I, I didn't have the patience for them. Anywho, it's about time that we dive into this game's story. But before we do that, um... Let me give you guys a little bit of a disclaimer real quick. While Digital Devil Saga, well, yes, has a story, it's more of a character-driven one. For a good chunk of the game, the events boil down to Surf dealing with the five tribes while protecting Sarah, and for the most part, that shit is simple. However, the real meat of the story is seeing these characters evolve and how they handle the situations that's thrown at them. As such, I am going to be spending a lot more time talking about the characters rather than the story in this game, and trust me, is gonna make sense, I promise. Like always, I will be putting a timestamp down below, and this time, I'm gonna remember to do this shit, because I have been lacking for the past few damn videos. But, with that being said, let's get on to it, shall we? This is the junkyard, a bleak and desolate place where everybody is fighting their tribes for survival. Here we're introduced to Surf and his tribe, the Embryon, who's fighting against another tribe called the Vanguard for this weird, uh, egg thing that suddenly appeared. As the two are fighting, the egg begins to glow and suddenly launches multiple beams of light through everyone on the battlefield, and well... <laughs> And then they're going to eat me! Oh my god! Surf ends up being woken up by his right hand man, Heat, where he then directs him to the remnants of the egg from earlier and the only thing left inside being a mysterious woman. The Embryon brings her back to their base and soon after they start to try to figure out what happened to them when they were fighting the Vanguards. This leads to Surf, Heat, and the tribe's sharpshooter, Arjula, to go to their base to investigate. However, when they show up, they're met with the Vanguard's leader, Harvey, who's scared out of his mind. He goes on about us turning into demons, which ends up causing a massive argument. It then reaches a boiling point when Arjula ends up shooting at the vanguards and later transforms alongside he and surf into demons after defeating some of his memories we end up chasing harvey across the base with us later being forced to kill him after he tries to kill us in this demon form surf and the others head back to the base where we see the tribe's recon cielo trying to fight off against a transformed gale however it quickly ends with the mysterious woman begins singing the lullaby that is able to sedate him moments after we learn that the mysterious woman's name is sarah though we don't really learn much about her as he's suffering from memory loss as the group is trying to understand what's going on and what to do next surf is then requested to come to the karma temple for an appointment meeting. Surf heads there and we're met with the leaders of the other tribes in the junkyard. There's Janana of the Maribels, Mick the Slug of the Solids, Lupa of the Wolves, and Varen of the Brutes, who instantly gives us the meanest death stare. Damn, the fuck did we do to you? We still meet this world's quote unquote god, Angel, who urges all the tribes with their new powers to not only kill one another, but to also find the black haired girl, i.e. Sarah. By doing both, the tribe who is able to complete this task will be able to reach Nirvana, a sort of heaven for the people of the junkyard. As Surf asks who this girl could be, Angel freaks out and angrily repeats their orders for the tribes to kill each other and find the black haired girl. And from here, the story begins to follow a pretty simple routine that starts with the Embryon finding their next tribe to target, them either teaming up with said tribe to fight another, or making an elaborate plan to deal with, again, said tribe. We fight and kill the tribe's leader, no matter who that is, and then they go on and do the same shit until they're the last one standing. Yeah, to be honest, there's not much really going on for most of the game, however, the story is mostly being carried by Surf and the others who we see going through a lot of changes. And it doesn't only apply to their character development as one of the major plot points of the story is the people in the junkyard essentially regaining their humanity or more accurately being reawakened early on in the game everyone and i mean everyone in the junkyard is almost robotic they appear human they don't really act like one however as they begin to harness their new demonic powers they end up being more well human and with everything that comes with being a human it leads to a lot of the events to go from being pretty easy to solve 
to being a lot more complicated. We instantly see this when Janana's right hand man, Bat, betrays her out of jealousy and begins working with the other tribes to take down the Embryons. And like I mentioned before, all of these events that would happen during this chunk of the game puts Surf and the others into situations that were previously easy to handle, but now is difficult because of their newfound emotions. But the characters aren't the only ones driving this story, as there is an overall mystery as to why when gaining these demonic powers, it leads to the people in the junkyard to essentially become human again. And to make things even more mysterious, it's the world itself, and especially Sarah, who we'll talk about in a minute. Now, before we continue, I do want to take this time and talk about Surf and his crew real quick and what they go through. Though describing some of the characters are going to be a little weird, so, um... Bear with me. <laughs> Starting things off, we have the Embryon's leader, Surf, who pretty much is your standard silent protag. However, the story, while loosely alluding to it, reveals that he's just as important as Sarah. How so, you may ask? No clue until we play the second game. Next is Heat, Surf's right hand man. He's initially a ruthless, bloodthirsty dude who's ready to fuck shit up, but that's until he meets Sarah, and when I tell you this man's world turns upside down, you would think he found the woman of his dreams. The fuck? Oh shit. Sorry. One second. Hey, yep. What's up? Yep. Ain't no goddamn way. There's a point in the story where if you couldn't tell this dude was obsessed with Sarah, it damn near gets plastered everywhere when Surf and the others have to go to coordinate 136 in order to save her from the solids. Prior to doing this, he gets so worked up from her disappearance that he almost beats the shit out of his own comrade. Then there's one more event where after defeating Bat and dealing with some of the brutes, he... Next is Arjula, who compared to the others in the group is the most in tune with her emotions. In a way, she ends up acting as the compassionate and empathetic force for the team, and this really becomes the case with her relationship with Janana, who, despite only knowing her for like a small amount of time, ends up leaving an impact on her. And this later leads to her trying to get revenge on Bat, which at first doesn't go as planned, but she eventually gets it. Next is Sela, whose role in the story is minuscule at best. He's a comic relief character with a Jamaican accent, which oddly enough sounds pretty pretty decent, and the way he, that he regains his humanity is when he fails to save Sarah and wants redemption for failing to protect her. Beyond that though, there isn't really much to him here. And finally is Gale, the Embryon's main strategist and the last character in the group to regain his humanity. But what's weird about that is that he could have regained his humanity a whole lot sooner. During certain moments of the game, he will end up envisioning this mysterious woman, which will quickly bring life back into his eyes. And while the story doesn't explain that just yet, it is foreshadowing for what's to come in the next game. Other than that, he stays the same until the Embryon ends up teaming up with the Wolves to take out the Brutes. However, as they're making their way through the waterway, the group has to fight off against Lupa, who ends up going out of control while in his demon form. His death and the request he asks for Gale to find someone for him, causing him to finally regain his humanity, making him less of a robot, though he still acts like one from time to time. And after this bit with Gale and everyone in the party having regained their humanity, uh... Yeah, this is the part when the story begins to uh, speed up a bit. After making it to the Brute's base and finding off the last remaining members, we end up coming face to face with their leader, Varen, or excuse me, <clears throat> uh, Colonel Beck. Yeah, as unlike the other tribe leaders we've encountered so far, he not only managed to regain his humanity, but he also managed to regain his memories. And because of this, he has a fucking vendetta against us. We end up having to go through a pretty long battle and manage to beat him. But just before he ends up biting the dust, Beck ends up dropping a bombshell that leaves the group shocked and confused. Everyone here in the junkyard was originally human, but had died and was placed in here as a sort of digital purgatory, if that makes sense. And yeah, that digital that's in the name of this game isn't just for show. The entire first game has been in the digital world. And according to Beck, the one responsible for putting us here in the first place was Sarah, who suspected Viciously vanished. After learning about this and finding out that Sarah is gone, Surf and the others head to the Karma Temple for answers. As the group ascend the temple, we end up seeing Sarah confronting a woman who's revealed to be Angel, the voice we heard from the beginning of the game and the woman that Gale keeps envisioning. Angel threatens to destroy the junkyard and reveals that Sarah is this thing called a Cyber Shaman and that her real name is Seraphita. Don't worry, we'll learn about that next time. 
Just as Sarah is about to go with Angel, Surf and the others show up just in time to save her. This leads to a long fight against Angel where they manage to defeat her, but just as Surf attempts to kill her, she blocks his attack with a virus meant to destroy the junkyard. And with the virus destroyed, the junkyard begins to quickly vanish, leading to Surf and the others to quickly run towards the gate. After a bit of foreshadowing here and there, Surf attempts to reach the gate but it ends up exploding. And as everyone is floating through the bright void, Sarah makes a promise to find Surf before floating away from each each other. And after the credits end, we see Surf walking through a desolate world that is now made of a sand, old buildings, and the sun that is mysteriously black. And if you were thinking to yourself, there is no way the game ends there. After my first playthrough, I remember feeling underwhelmed by the ending, but after the second playthrough, I ended up actually feeling a lot more content this time, especially after realizing that this is meant to be a sort of a setup game. The whole purpose is for this game to introduce these characters to us and see them develop with each situation that's thrown at them. And after having realized this and also understanding that this story was always meant to be a two-parter, yeah, it, it changed my perspective on some things. Namely, the characters and the fact that some of the stuff that they went through is foreshadowing for what's to come. Everything from his obsession with Sarah, Gail constantly envisioning Angel, the mystery behind who Sarah is, and many more. There's other things as well, but those in particular are things I'm really hoping to see get resolved or answered in the next game. Everything else for the most part though is fine. There's a clear antagonistic force with the other tribes and Angel, which keeps things mostly interesting. And the first chunk of the game is good, but not as interesting as the last bit of it. Though something I really enjoyed about this game was his religious imagery and how well it uses it. Now, disclaimer, I only have passing knowledge of Hinduism. So if I end up getting anything wrong, please let me know in the comments down below. Just don't be a dick about it. Cool, gotcha. Let's continue. One of the things that I noticed about this game was how noticeable the religious themes were. This is usually the case for Megaton games, but I don't think it was ever as strongly presented as it was in here. Everything from the way that the buildings look, some of the major bosses that you have to face, and hell, even the damn gameplay systems are either heavily based or inspired by those religious themes. But for a while, I wasn't sure of whether or not it was based around either Hinduism or Buddhism, because both are related to one of the big things in this game, Mantra. That was until I looked it up a bit more and came across another thing in this game, Atma, which to make a long story short, refers to someone's true self or essence. And we see this as not only the symbols on all the characters, but it's twisted in the way where devouring others can make you more human, something that I thought was pretty unique. And after seeing it play out in the story and in its gameplay, it was a nice attention to detail. Other than that, I really liked the story and how they handled the characters, but there isn't much left I can really talk about without potentially spoiling the next game. But I will say this, if you want to get the most out of this game's story, make sure you understand that everything going on here will be answered in a sequel. Do this and you may be able to enjoy the story just a little bit more. But where there isn't really much in terms of this game's story, there is a lot when it comes down to the gameplay. If you've played Nocturne or any of the other countless Megaton games that uses press turn, then you, my friend, are in luck, because Digital Devil Saga's gameplay essentially takes the battle system from Nocturne and mixes a couple things up. Now, if you don't know what press turn is, I do recommend checking out my Nocturne video where I do go a little bit in depth with it. But to give a quick explanation, the system revolves around exposing the enemy's weakness while covering your own. Doing so will give you more turns to either keep on supplying the pain or doing other things like setting buffs or healing. Once you fully understand the press turn system, especially here, it makes the game a lot easier. However, press turn also applies to enemies, so if you're not careful, then the enemy is going to have a field day with your ass, so be mindful of that when building your party out. And something I realized during this playthrough was that Digital Devil Saga may or may not have taken inspiration from Final Fantasy X. For one thing, the party layout has been lowered to three instead of four, meaning that you're at a slight disadvantage when going up against enemies, especially the ones that can easily outnumber you. Another thing which I mentioned earlier is that the flow of battles feels just as quick as the battles in Final Fantasy X. And finally, there is a particular system that as you level up, you gain new abilities, which in hindsight is more of a direct inspiration from Nocturne's Makatama system, but is still as familiar as the Sphere Grid. Regardless, this particular system in question is the Mantra system. By buying a mantra from the terminal and leveling it up completely, you'll gain new abilities that can be equipped to your character. And overall, there's 80 mantras you could buy which has a variety of skills to choose from. 
they'll uh, just be prepared to spend the equivalent of a mortgage later down the line. These 80 plus mantras are generally split between 6 paths and you're able to interchange between each one. The first path contains your standard physical skills, the second has all your elemental magic like Agi, Bufu, Zio, and Zan, and exclusive to this game and its sequel is the Terra magic. The third path has both healing magic and skills that can either inflict or outright avoid status ailments. The fourth path has buffs and debuffs as well as Hama and Mudo magic. While Mudo still acts like a one hit kill, Hama now takes off half of an enemy's health or player's health depending on who gets hit with it. And finally is the fifth and sixth paths which has drain skills and lets inactive party members get the same amount of XP as if they were a part of the active party. For the most part, the game gives you the freedom to choose how to customize your party's skills. Surf specifically has the most freedom to what skills you can put on him as you can also affect his stats. So if you wanted to, you could make him a glass cannon with powerful magic or a buff and debuff specialist if you wanted to. So that can't be said for the other members in your party as they don't really get as much freedom because they have their own predefined path. Arjula is the healer, Heat is the warrior, Gale is the mage, and Cello is, well, uh, he, he's useless in this game, unfortunately. But here's the thing, it's still possible to switch a party member from being a healer to being a mage and vice versa. They're still trying to make a character like he, whose main stats go into strength, into a mage. Trust me, it's not going to work out. But what turns the system from a great idea to it being poorly executed is the way you level up these mantras. There's karma, which adds extra experience for your character, and then there's atma points, or AP, which is how you level up your mantra. Albeit, the amount you get from just defeating enemies is low as shit. So in order to get more, you're going to have to use hunt skills. These skills or physical attacks are attainable through the first path of the mantra chart, and if you manage to lower their health down to the red, you can use these skills to finish them off. But this isn't a 100% guarantee as it has a chance to fail, and in order for the hunt skill to be more effective, you need to understand the press turn system to its fullest, as by exploiting enemy's weaknesses and covering your own, you'll be able to frighten the enemy to the point where hunt skills ends up being a lot more effective. But wait! There's more! If you end up using the hunt skill too much, you can get a stomach ache of all status ailments. This ailment works similarly to being paralyzed where you may or may not have the chance to attack, but what makes this worse is that you're not going to be able to gain any more AP while you have that ailment still on you. Ugh, and yes, this happens a lot during the first half of the game. And in order to avoid this, you need to get the Holy Beast Mantra, which has Iron Stomach, a passive skill that prevents you from getting the stomach ache. Only problem with that shit is that not only does it cost over 50,000 maka to get, but you won't be able to obtain this mantra until around halfway through the game. Now don't get it twisted, it is available, but the chances of you having 50,000 maka at that point, let alone over 150,000 for all three of your characters that you'll have in your party, yeah, the chances are pretty fucking low. This and the fact that the more powerful skills a mantra has, the more expensive it'll be, damn near turns this game into a grind fest. Even though you make money and level up at a decent rate, the prices of mantra throughout the game can easily cause you to go bankrupt. You dead ass will be spending 95% of your maka on mantra, so you might just might be able to afford some healing items without being left with no money. And you know, man, it's funny. It's really funny, right? It's funny how Atlas decides to create a game that is made to be accessible for casual JRPG fans. Yet, they decided to fuck us with this system. If you couldn't tell, I don't like the way this system works, even when I fully understood it. Despite the freedom you have of creating whatever build you want, the process of gaining AP to get those skills is so damn tedious. Luckily, there's these things known as field hunts, where by destroying these little black orbs, you can summon a Matama that'll grant you a ton of both AP and money. Only problem is that these little motherfuckers are weird when it comes to how they respawn. During my play for this video, I was able to do the field hunt at coordinate 136 after having done it for the first time. Now keep that in mind because when I went to the Maribel's base and where I had already done the hunt there during my first visit to this dungeon, for some bizarre reason it wouldn't respawn. Why? I still don't know to this day but it's bullshit. Now here's the thing right? You don't necessarily have to grind in this game. There's nothing stopping you from rushing through this game and getting the bare minimum from mantras. It's fine early on, but once you reach the halfway point, yeah, everything starts to go to hell. So, 
If you don't want to get your shit kicked in, then I suggest that you set aside a couple hours to not only grind out for the mantras, but to also get some money as well. And this is coming from someone who barely did anything during his first playthrough. So, luckily, there is a way to make things a little less grindy, and that is exploration. This has been something that existed in most, if not all, Megaton games, but Digital Devil Saga ended up taking this to a whole new level. Throughout the game, you'll come across colored walls that don't necessarily block you from your objective, but it does block you out of some extra goodies, and in order to get through them, you need to get that wall's corresponding key. And there's three overall, ranging from being pretty easy to find, to it being compared to finding needles in a haystack. Regardless, if you're thinking about playing this game, I urge you to get these keys and explore each dungeon thoroughly. Those little extra goodies you can find really makes this grind fest of a game slightly less grindy, such as these sell items, which if you end up selling them to a vendor during the max solar noise, this little thing right here on the top left corner that honestly doesn't really have that much utility, if I remember correctly, I don't remember, but if you end up selling it during that time, you can end up getting a lot of maka. Hell, I would also say this applies to the side quests in this game. They're usually locked behind yellow or red walls, and they only really involve you fighting optional bosses like King Frost, Beelzebub, Metatron, and more. But some of them do require you to grind your ass off to even stand a chance, and the only way to really do some of these fights without any issues by doing the new game plus. This carries over all the mantra that you've mastered alongside their skills, as well as the mantras you've bought but never mastered. It also unlocks the secret boss of the game, Demi Fiend. Oh, nigga! Yeah, if you end up doing this one, good luck, you're gonna need it. If you manage to understand and overcome some of the issues in this game, you'll come to find that Digital Devil Saga is easy. Even with the annoyance that is the mantra system, the game gives you a lot of resources to make the process of not only getting those mantras and also doing everything else less arduous. Even the bosses aren't that bad to deal with as it's all about pattern recognition and making sure your resistances are covered. And this is the case for almost all of the bosses here. So for example, let's take Kamazots, whose whole thing is to be an absolute nuisance during his available turns and ending it by shielding himself like a little bitch. When he's in this state, he can shield himself from physical attacks and greatly reduces all forms of damage you drop on him. But if you end up using Terra, he ends up going back to normal. Add that with your most powerful skills and he ends up going down in an instant. And mind you, this applies to all three encounters for him, so he's one of the more easier bosses to deal with. Another boss I could bring up is Ravana. Now this is a boss that if you manage to cover up your resistances, he becomes an absolute cakewalk. The only thing annoying about him is the fact that he has a move called Hunger Wave that makes you either not attack or hurt your allies. Luckily, it can be cured by Sarah, though if all three party members get hit with this shit, uh, you may or may not be fucked. And when looking back at some of the bosses I had to deal with and which ones really gave me a hard time, um, the only one that I could think of for not only my first playthrough but for my second one was Lupa. And the only reason he was difficult was because I didn't have De Kaja and De Kunda, which you need for this fight. Hell, even the final boss wasn't that hard. And mind you, that is a rare thing to say with most Megaton games. She has three phases, with the last one being the one that I was stuck on during my playthrough. During this phase, she has six orbs that correspond to the five magic skills in this game and a physical skill. And if you get rid of one of them, she will spend a free turn trying to bring it back. At first, this boss will seem daunting as she has over seven to eight turns, all dedicated to giving you a game over and making you cry. But if you end up having your resistances covered and use skills that can hit everything, you'll end up dragging her ass through the mud like it was nothing. And all of this is possible if you end up understanding how to get through some of the more annoying aspects of this game. Now, one last thing before we wrap things up. During major cutscenes, you might have moments where you can make one out of two choices. While not all of them are important, if you want to get some extra shit in the next game, you might need a guide to see which choices to make, and this also applies to being the game in general, as certain things will carry over to the sequel. If you be some of the side bosses, you'll get special rings, which we'll go more in depth with when the time comes. Overall, uh, Digital Devil Saga was a pretty cool experience. I'm surprised that a lot of my original opinions have changed about this game. It could more likely be because I've played more Megaton games, so I fully understand what to expect from them. Or it could be the fact that I didn't really rush through this game this time and I ended up, you know, taking my time with it. And in that case, you know, I can actually see that being that being the case right there. Regardless, 
I wish I could talk about this game just a little more. But after doing my research and having to dodge spoilers like Smash players dodging a shower, going in more depth about this game will require me to have played the sequel, which as you can tell throughout the video, I am really looking forward to. So, should you play Digital Devil Saga? Yes. I gotta find a way to spice that up, I, I really do. If you want to be able to play this game, you can get a copy of it for under $30. You can also play it on PS3 and is what I would say if there wasn't already a fix available. And to make a long story short, I'm just gonna put a tweet down in the description below so you guys can, uh, you know, go and do that if you decide to play the PS3 versus so you know, all that good shit, you know, yay! <laughs> and with that, thank you guys so much for watching till the end of the video. I do want to extend an apology for how long this video took to come out. And uh, if you have been here for a while now, you already know it's because of school. As much as, it's very annoying right now. It is almost done. So please pray for me or whatever and shit because I'm going to need it. Uh, but I also want to extend an apology for those who were looking forward to Majin Tensei and Ron. I tried my best. I really did. But my patience was running thin when I was playing through these games. And I didn't want to make y'all wait like what? Almost a month or two for me to cover it. Even though this video... Uh, well, that's besides the point. Hell, I think my patience for most of the older Megaton games are low right now. But uh, who knows? That, that might change in the future, but we'll just have to see. But the next time I see you guys, we'll be covering the sequel, Digital Devil Saga 2. And if all goes well, and if finals don't kick me in my ass, I might be able to get this out a little sooner. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Please! Like always, make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video. Hit the bell notification so you guys know when the next video is going to be coming out. And make sure to stay safe. Take some allergy meds because the pollen is kicking my ass and I'm pretty sure it's kicking your ass right now too. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace!